this morning, our scripture comes from Matthew, uh, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. Please follow along with me as I read from the New Living Translation. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from every, any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone who he was. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So what's in a name? That which we call rose by any other name would smell as sweet. That was the question asked in Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. You know, their families, if you remember, way back to your high school English class, because I'm sure you haven't read it lately, um, their, enemy, or their families were sworn enemies. And if you remember Romeo and Juliet, these two young people had fallen in love, and their love story didn't end well. What does the statement mean? What's in a name? Well, as I was reading, trying to understand what Shakespeare had in mind, one site suggested that someone or something is called or labeled, what someone or something is called is coincidental compared to their inherent quality. It doesn't mean a thing. And I think I beg to differ with that. It might be true in that situation, certainly, but not in all. In fact, for many, names are quite important and speak to the heritage of the person or to the hopes and dreams that their parents have for them. And sometimes, in the case of nicknames, they describe an attribute that someone has. My dad used lots of nicknames in his life with his children and his grandchildren. He called Wendy Pumpkin. I don't know that she looks like a pumpkin, but that's what he called her. I was Keanu, Julie was Blondie. The boys were often called Charlie. And then there was the ever popular Squirt or Skeezy. He had a lot of names for them and for us. And as he got older, using a nickname helped him to save face when he couldn't remember what their names really were. He used them all the time. I'm sure you have nicknames in your family as well. Anybody have one they want to share? I live with the antique man. Bubblehead. Bubblehead. <laughs> oh, Chuck. It's not him. Oh, it's not him. That's right. We are not going to say who that is. His identity will remain hidden. But we all use different names um, in our families and with our friends. This morning, Simon is given a new name by Jesus. It was a blessing, his name, as well as an encouragement based on what Jesus saw in Simon as a man and as a follower. And it all started when Jesus, in this morning's scripture, asked two important questions. But before we get to the questions, I just wanna lay a little groundwork. So here we are, and at this point in Jesus' ministry, two and a half years have passed. Two and a half years with Simon and all the other disciples, including Judas, Two and a half years of teaching miracles and of Jesus sharing his life with them. Two and a half years of him sharing bit by bit with them about who he was and trying to teach them about who they were. 
They had seen much and heard much, but still had so much to uh, learn. They were unsure of and needed a better understanding of who Jesus really was. There were glimmers of understanding, but they needed to have a rock solid understanding. So as their ministry continued, the crowds continued to follow them, and the church leaders and the critics continued to pick at them. There was no private time, and that was what they needed. A respite, a getaway, time totally with their teacher. And so Jesus took them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. If you're to look at a map of the Sea of Galilee, you want to go to the next screen? That shows up pretty good, really. I'm glad. If you were to look at that map, the Sea of Galilee, and you trace up along its um, rib, um, the, the lake to the north, about 25 miles, you'll see way up in the right-hand corner, my right, your right, the name Caesarea Philippi. That's where he took them, far, far away. This is the headwaters of the Jordan River, the artery of water that feeds the whole country of Israel. It starts there and flows to the Sea of Galilee, Galilee and then down to the Dead Sea where it evaporates. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, who lived around 90 BC, he says there's a, there was a huge cave there, and you can still see where it was today, and it's at the foot of Mount Hermon. And it was filled with water, and that water became the Jordan River. Since then, the cave has collapsed because of an earthquake, and big rocks blocked the opening. But you can see where it was, and the important thing to remember is that this river was a source of life, and as it flowed, it was called living water. Have you heard that term before, living water? Well, it was a place that had historical um, beginnings, and it was important not only to the Jews, to, but to many around them. There were 14 shrines to pagan deities at that site, as well as a temple built by Herod of Philippi for Caesar Augustus, hence the name Caesarea Philippi. You know, Caesar, was like all the other Caesars. He wanted to be worshipped as a god. And so there he was, and there were all those other idols. And so for many people, it was recognized as a place of worship. But if you think about it, it is just like Jesus who said he had the living water to take them to a place of living water. Maybe deliberately to contrast who these idols were and who he was. One more thing. Last week, we were down at the Sea of Galilee, 700 feet below sea level. The land there is scorching hot. If you don't drink enough water, you can get dehydrated. It's hard to live there. And last week, there was spiritual heat there, as well as heat of politics, and just the general heat of the day. But now, up in Caesarea Philippi, they are at a cool place a refreshing place with Jesus, a time he has set aside to be with them to establish a new beginning, and he does so by asking two questions. You know, think back to your, um, maybe one of your job interviews. I think a good interviewer starts out with a, a less than threatening question, one that's gonna put the interviewee at ease a little bit. And so what Jesus asks these disciples of his is who do the people say that I am? If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about this section of scripture and Jesus was compared to Jeremiah and we talked about why. They say um, that Jesus was compared with Elijah, John the Baptist, and certainly Jeremiah. And they were able to answer that question without threat or without too much thought because that's what everybody else thought. But then Jesus goes to the next question. Question number two. In that question, he would contrast what other people thought with what they thought themselves. He put them on the spot. Jesus asked, who do, uh, he said, who do you think that 
I am. Who do you think that Jesus is? It's an important question for them, and it's an important question for us as well. Some think he is still that mysterious yet charismatic figure that attracts people and sometimes his very presence pushes them away. There are a lot of different ideas today as to who Jesus is or was. The important question isn't what everybody else thinks, but what the disciples thought, and today, what you think. Peter listens to that question and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He gives Jesus a two-in-one answer. The first part, before the comma, says Jesus is the one. He is the Christ. Do you know what the word Christ means? It is from the Greek word Christos, and it has the equivalent of the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach, it means to swipe to wipe over. When all of the kings of Israel were anointed, they were Mashiach. They were wiped over with oil. We think of a, a simple anointing in our church as just a few drops of oil. They doused them. They wiped their face with oil. They were, there was no doubt when the prophet was done who was the new king. Jesus is the Mashiach. The Christos, the wiped and swiped one, he is Messiah. And that's the important part for us, the anointed one. And so, Christ means Messiah. Christ was and is the one God promised would come someday, the one that all of Israel had been waiting for. And Simon gets it. Jesus is the one. But he doesn't totally understand what he said. The six words after the comma, the son of the living God, those are equally as important too. Jesus is the only begotten son of the Father. And with those words, Peter is not saying that Jesus is just another prophet in a long history of prophets or another teacher in a line and lineage of teachers. Jesus is God. To be a son of God, made you God. That was a concept that was easy for the people of the day to understand. They came from many cultures and were surrounded, even in the moment, with all these temples of all these deities. But for Peter to say this was a difficult thing and maybe a dangerous thing because he was monotheistic. He had one God and only one God. And that was the only God that you worship. To say that Jesus was God could have gotten him killed, or at the very least, thrown in jail. But he holds nothing back. And with clarity and with purpose, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. With his out loud affirmation of absolute faith, Jesus gives Simon a new name. Now he would be called Peter. There's three important things we need to remember from this new name, this new name that he was given. First, it's a divine moment. Jesus says that human wisdom alone cannot reveal to the human heart who he is. This was a God moment. I'm sure some of us have had these moments where we are closer to God than we have ever been in our lives. This moment of understanding was given to God, or given to Peter, just as God makes it available to you and I. When we have questions and when our faith means lifting. In Mark chapter 9, there was a father who said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Jesus said, How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us or help us if you can. What do you 
me if I can, said Jesus. Anything is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. And Jesus did. This is the good news for us today. When we are struggling with our faith, as we do from time to time, we all need to ask God to speak words of reassurance to us. And then watch and wait and listen. As we pray and spend time with Jesus, when the time is right, just as he did for Peter, God's Spirit will give you and I the affirmation that we need in ways that cannot be understood or denied. So, it's a God moment. Second is the actual giving of his new name, Peter or Petrus. It means rock. Well, Petrus actually means a pebble, the kind that lies along the road or the kind that you can hold in your hand. Grounded in Christ, Peter would have the strength in the new church to lead it where it needed to go so that the church could continue. What Jesus saw in Peter at that moment was a man who would be solid and strong, even though he wasn't quite there yet. Once there was a boy about 15 years old who was called to the pitcher's mound to take over and finish the game. The other team's winning runs were on first and third, and there were no outs when the coach handed him the ball with these words. There was no one else I would rather have up there to pitch right now than you. What's remarkable is, at 40 years later, as a grown man, he remembered those words and he believed them. In that day, he pitched to three men. The first ball popped up to the catcher. He struck the second one out and grounded out the third. The coach told the whole team later that he gave the ball to him because he always came through in a clutch. It was the defining moment of his entire life. This was the defining moment of Simon's life. You are rock, and here's the ball. Take it and run. Was Jesus building his church on this pebble called Peter? No. He would build the foundation of his church on what Peter had just confessed out loud, and on the lives of all who have confessed the same thing, that Jesus was the very Son of God. That's the rock upon which God built his church. The rock is a totally different word. It is Petra, a solid, massive rock. Jesus, the Son of God, is that rock. Listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very, very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, and that is Jesus Christ. The foundation of the Christian church, of our church, for you and for me, is none other than Jesus Christ. It's not Peter. It wasn't Paul either. Nothing and no one will ever do but Jesus Christ. The foundation of our lives is Christ. He is our base. He is our reason for being. Everything we do must fit into his master blueprint, into his plan. Peter didn't understand all of that in this moment, but through the time he spent with Jesus, he would come to understand, and in his understanding, he would become the first great leader of the church of Jerusalem. And the scripture said he would hold the keys. What were those keys? When somebody has keys, it gives them the ability to open the door, right? When I was at the daycare center, I had a clutch of keys. I could open any door, from the front door to the office door to every classroom door in that center. I had the power. I had the responsibility. Peter was given the power and the responsibility to open the doors of the gospel to two major groups of his time the Jews, and the Gentiles. At Pentecost, Peter preached the first gospel message sermon to the Jews. And how many people joined the church that day? 3,000 or more. 
Later still, God chose him to speak to Cornelius, the first Gentile, to become a part of the church, the body of Christ. That was way back in the book of Acts as well. Peter opened the doors to the heaven, to heaven, with the keys to the kingdom. Thomas then took those very keys to the country of India, and Paul took them to the Roman world. You and I have keys as well. We take these same keys to the kingdom of those we encounter every day. What are they? It's what we confess. It's what we believe, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus expected Peter to live up to his name, and he did. Did he fail from time to time? He did. He's a human being. He's none other than a man. He puts his pants on, or his tunic, the same as you and I. What name would Jesus give you then? Whatever it is, it would be proportionate and appropriate to the gifts he's given you. It could be teacher, it could be servant, encourager, deacon, friend, helper, elder, partner, preacher, or just plain rock. Any one of those names is a name that comes with a blessing and a responsibility, an expectation. The expectation is that you and I live up to our name. Peter didn't understand the full meaning of his name or the expectation. He just received it, and eventually he used his understanding as the keys that would open up the doors of the kingdom to multitudes of others through his confession of faith and obedience. When Jesus said, who do you say that I am, Peter knew the answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is the stone that will make some people stumble and fall as they refuse to believe, as they refuse to have faith. But to those who believe, he is the solid rock on which we stand. And to that, the people of God would say, Amen. I think you need to say that loud. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, it's amazing to think that a door has been opened to us that you first gave to Peter. And he opened that door to the Jews and to the Gentiles alike. And those doors have been opened ever since through all the disciples, the missionaries, the churches, even us. You knocked on the door of our hearts, and we opened it up to you. I pray that, like Peter, we would be good and faithful stewards, used by you to open doors even wider to others so that they might find a relationship with you, so that they might realize that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Because Jesus is alive, our God is alive. Our faith and hope is also alive. We pray, Father, that it will blossom in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand now and affirm our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And there would be no other hymn that we could sing at this moment than the Church's One Foundation. That was a glitch in our bulletin. So look for that on page 442 of the Blue Handle or follow along 